Father in heaven, we want to reconnect with our previous thoughts on the French Revolution, the connection with the United States. We ask that you grant us the Holy Spirit that he can help us to, to do that, to bring these lines of truth together, these wheels within wheels. And I ask that the, the things that I teach here, that they would glorify and honor you and edify those that are watching these things. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going back to the first set of notes now. Um, I jumped forward to note two for today. Um, but I'm going back to page four of the first set of notes. On the bottom of page four, we had just read about Atman Muhammad II. And I want to focus in on the July 27th. And just, you can see it there in your notes. July 27th in the 26th day of the fourth month. This has been put in place repeatedly. Theodore, Odilio, Stephen, myself, Daniel, um, and others, no doubt, that when you take the prophecy of Revelation 9, as you can see in the outline below, that Atman, on the left side of that outline, on the bottom of page 4, July 27, 1299, in the Julian, was the 26th day of the fourth month. 150 years later, it takes you to July 27th, 1449, Gregorian, 26th day of the fourth month. And then if you're going to take the time prophecy of Revelation 9, which is a year, a month, a day, and an hour, and you apply a year, 360 years from 1449, it takes you to July 27th, 1809, in the Gregorian. Um, a, a month takes you to 30 years beyond that, which would be 1839, July 27th, and both of those dates I just mentioned are also the 26th day of the fourth month. If you go a day, a day is a year, you go to 1840, which is July 15th, um, the July 27th, 1840, on the Gregorian, which is the 26th day of the fourth month, and you go an hour from there and it projects you to August 11th, 1840, which is July 30th on the Julian, but it's the 12th day of the fifth month. But in, in any case, in this line of Revelation 9, you have one, two, three, four, five occurrences. Is it five or six? One, two, three, four, five. Five occurrences of July 27th, and they're all the 26th day of the fourth month, and the historical events that line up with the July 27th of those years um, agree with the message of Revelation 9. It's absolutely impossible mathematically for this to happen. Okay, it's just, it's just the, the idea that the July 27th would happen five times in a row agree with prophetic fulfillment, and prophetic fulfillment mean the history that fulfills it speaks to the, the history that's identified in the prophecy that makes the prediction, the history and the July 27th would be virtually mathematically impossible. But when you add to it the third dynamic, that the biblical date of the 26th day of the fourth month also would line up with these five occurrences of July 27th, it, it's just not reasonable to think that this is a coincidence. It's impossible. Okay, so July 27th becomes a symbol of Islam upon many witnesses. Um, and so does the 26th day of the, the fourth month. And on page 5, just some of these mathematical um, observations. In the box on the top of page 5, July 27th equals the 27th day of the seventh month. Okay, um, that's the European way to express it, by the way, right? We go November 27th, they go the 7th of November. Yeah, they go the, the date before the month. Day, month, year versus month, day, year. Okay, so, so, so that's, I'm just pointing, I, I get that, I'm pointing out for you. We're expressing it in the European fashion there. July 27th is how we express it, month, day, but that equals 27-7. Seven. 
day, month, European. And then if you just turn it into a number, it's 277. And if you take the biblical number that lines up with July 27th, these five times in Revelation 9, the biblical number being the 26th day of the fourth month, it equals 264. Everyone with me? So if you take 277 and add it to 264, it comes to 541. And from 1840, if you subtract 1299, because it all begins on July 27th, 1299 and it ends on July 27th, 1840. If you subtract 1299 from 1840, it equals 541. <laughs> Not only do you have this phenomenon of in the prophecy of Revelation 9, July 27th, matching the history five times, and that all five of those times it's the 26th day of the fourth month, you also have this... 27th day. Did you say 27th? I said the 26th day of the fourth month in the biblical calendar. The, the, the numerical revelations from these numbers also speaks to that very same history. It's, it's, beyond, it's beyond human. Okay, July 18th is, is the midnight cry, July 18th, 2020. And the European way to express it is not 718 like we would, 7 being July 18th, we'd say July 18th, but the European way is 187. Okay, 18th month of the seventh, 18th day of the seventh month, which is 187. So 277 from the above work, 277 times 264 equals 73,128. And if you divide it by 391, which is a symbol of Islam, the 391 years, it equals 187. And 187 is the 18th day of the seventh month, and it's July 18th. It's, Amen. pardon me? Amen. It's unbelievable. And, and 391, is, of course, found in Ezekiel's prophecy of Josiah, and it's found in Revelation 9, which was opened up by Josiah Litch. And 391 is repeatedly found in our history, in the footsteps of our history of this movement. And it's a symbol of Islam. And where you see 391 in your notes, 391 is a symbol, is a symbol of the Islamic calendar in the sense that the Gregorian calendar that we use and the Islamic calendar that Islam uses, they only come together, they only align every 391 years. <laughs> Some, someone named Palmoni was designing all this millions of years ago. Okay, 264, now this one may be a little bit more Difficult to follow, but it's just as profound. 264 is the 26th day of the fourth month. It's July 27th, right? Okay, okay so 264 and 2604. And we understand that zero, just simple math, you're going into grade school, they're going to tell you, the first thing they'll tell you about zero is it's a placeholder. It's just simply a placeholder. There's nothing there. Okay, so 264... And we can put a zero in there between the 26 and the 4, put a placeholder in there if we have some kind of prophetic justification for doing so, and we do, okay? 277 European is 27-7. It's July 27th equals 264 from Revelation 9 equals 2604. The reason that we can see this is the mirror of the 2520. The mirror of the 2520 is 2,604 years long. What is the mirror of the 2520? You have it in there. It begins in 742 when Isaiah confronts Ahaz in Isaiah 7. And in 742, Isaiah is going to give a time prophecy of 65 years, thus giving us the point of reference for beginning the 2520 chiasm that begins in 742 and goes to 1863. And from 742 BC to 1863 is illustrated here on this for you, if you, you're not seeing it, it's 26 
hundred and four years. Twenty-six four two sixty-four. Okay. It, it, no, it's the length. The length from 742 to BC to 1863 just happens to be 264. 2604. Now, this chiasm that we use, our point of reference for the, the 2520 for looking at chiasms is the chiasm of Christ's time that he confirmed the covenant on earth. So you have that chiasm below 2, and from 27 A.D. to 34 A.D. is 84 months. And the center of that chiasm is the cross in 31 A.D. And 31 times 84 is what? 2,604, 2, the same number as the mirror of the 2520 and they both represent the 26th day of the fourth month or July 27th. July 18, 2020 is the 26th day of the fourth month in both the biblical calendar and the rabbinical calendar. And the biblical calendar and the rabbinical calendar do not always line up. But on July 18th, 2020, they do. And July 18th, 2020 is the 26th day of the fourth month, which in Revelation 9 is July 27th, five times. So to think that July 18th, 2020 is not Islam is not clear thinking. It's not clear thinking. Okay, so I'm putting that in place because July 27th is what? A symbol of what? July. Islam. Yeah. It's a symbol of Islam at the simple level. So the fact that the State Department of the United States was began on July 27th, 1789, all by itself should say, hey, there's some kind of connection with Islam in the United States. But the fact that 490 years previous to July 27, 1789 is the beginning of the prophecies of Revelation 9 on July 27, 1299. It's saying the United States has a connection with Islam that is profound and that it has to do with their probationary time. Their probationary time is being identified at the very beginning of the United States. And it's not necessarily a time. What is it? It's saying that the probationary time of the United States comes to a conclusion in connection with Islam. Okay, right? Because Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. And at the beginning of the United States in 1789, the United States is connected with Islam by the date July 27th, but it is also connected with probationary time by the number 490. Thus, at the beginning of the United States in 1789, we see Islam, we see France in the French Revolution and the Constitution, the Rights of Man, and those are speaking to the end of the United States. They're speaking to when probation closes for the United States of America, and we've already put in the prophetic record, in the public record, that prophetically the United States closes its progress, probation progressively from the midnight cry, which is July 18th, 2020, to the Sunday Law, which is December 25th, 2021. This is where the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy is going down, and the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy is rising. You can't separate the role of Islam from taking down the United States. Islam is illustrated in the story of Balaam. How many times does the false prophet Balaam, the United States, strike Islam in the story of Islam in the story of Balaam, Islam being represented by the ass? How many times does it strike it? Three times. When did it first strike it? 9/11. Put a restraint on it. Went into Iraq. Went into Afghanistan. Started killing its leaders. When's the second strike? 
It's going to be in response to the, to the July 18th nuclear attack. Trump's going to respond. But the third time that Balaam strikes Islam, what happens to the ass and Balaam in that third manifestation? They, go down together. they fall. They go down together. They fall. Okay, the fall of the United States, the end of the Sixth Kingdom, December 25th, 2021, at the third strike. What happens at the second strike on July 18th to Balaam? He's crippled. He's crippled. It cripples the United States. We think we're crippled now, and we're not even to July 18th. Throw a nuclear bomb into the, the story and see what happens to the economy. See what happens to martial law. See what happens to the people in the United States that have had enough of your idea and you've had enough of my idea because they're all loaded for bear. They all have their weapons in hand and all the ammunition they can buy. It's always been interesting to me that uh, he crushes his foot. He crushes his he foot. crushes his foot. What do you do with your feet? You walk places. It would seem like it would be crushing the ability of the United States to move about. Oil, the ability to operate yeah. vehicles. Yep, could be. Makes sense. The foot has to be speaking to something. A crippled foot. Okay. Back to uh, page six of your notes. Um, yes, question. You left us hanging on November 9th. Yes, what did. happened on November 9th? I don't know if you're coming back to that. Well, tell me what happened on November 9th. We don't. How can you not? Well, know? you mean on 2016? Yeah, yeah you're talking about 2016. An election? Election of who? Oh, 2000. Trump. Trump. And what president is he? So at the very point in time that the 45th president of the United States has been elected, one month later, the Lord removes his hand from Rafi and Paniam. Okay? You've just reached the 45th president. You've just touched it the same way the Millerites touched 1844 when the Lord removed his hand. Okay, he, this is the history here that's introducing the 45th president of the United States. That's why I didn't answer. I thought you all would know that. And you did. You figured it out after you thought it through. This is about the number 45. The 45th president of the United States has just been elected. Okay, he's just been elected. And then the Lord removes his hand. The number 45 is a symbol of the 1335 that touches 1844. When 1843 ended, then the Lord removed his hand. Thereafter, they recognized the fullness of the year mistake. Okay? So it's, it's, it's all tied together with the number 45. 45th President of the United States. Donald Trump. Okay, so now we're switching gears a little bit. I'm still on the first set of notes, just a little bit, to remind us that Revelation 11 is illustrating the history of the French Revolution. This quote we used the other day says that God's people will prophesy in sackcloth. Okay? And in the last sentence from Testimonies, Volume 4, page 594, it says, They are to be his witnesses in the world, his instrumentalities to do a special work, a glorious work in the day of his preparation. So I don't intend to um, read all these. And I'm not sure that it's even in here. The idea is, if you go back to page 16, because the day of his preparation, I mentioned it yesterday, I said... We're in the day of his preparation, but it's, the, it's several days in Scripture. I mentioned it, and I just put a compilation here to point you to, to remind you that from 9-11 until the door closes is identified as a, a certain day in Bible prophecy. And we came to understand this long ago 
when the Midnight Cry message was first opening up in 2014, in the argument over the book of Joel, okay, or Joel, I say Joel, everyone says Joel. And there were people that were confused about what the day of the Lord was, so we ended up going, because the, Joel talks about the day of the Lord, and we went in and we seen this distinction between preparation day and Sabbath, and the day of the Lord's preparation, and the day of the Lord, and it became established publicly. So. From that, we've seen that from 9-11 until the door closes is the day of the Lord's preparation. So I just want to remind us of that. If you go to page 16 of these notes, the quote I just looked at, it's the day of His preparation when you're going to prophesy in sackcloth. Therefore, I'm saying from 9-11 from until the door closes. When does the door close? July 18, 2020, for, the, for what we are focusing on here. Those people that are presenting the message for God, what are they? The okay, but what are they? Prophesying They're prophesying in sackcloth. What, what does that mean? They're hidden. They're not, they're not the, yeah. the focal point of public attention based upon the commentary on Revelation 11. Amen. Okay? And I, I don't want to miss one little point, okay, while I'm here. Revelation 11 is about the king of the south, atheistic France, right? And that's what we're dealing with. But we're also, we've tied together, 1789 ties together not only atheistic France with the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, the Constitution, the connection between Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, the connection there is strong and the United States, but we's all, we have also tied together Islam, right? And the story of Islam and July 27th, where do we get that from? Revelation 9. nine. Okay, so the, the, the two lines that are speaking to the story of the Constitution is Revelation 9 and Revelation 11. Okay, don't miss that, 9-11. Right. And in the middle there is the test. What's the test in between 9 and 11? Ten. It's chapter 10. It's when the angel comes down and you take the book and eat it. Okay? It's the test that begins at 9-11 and whether or not we're going to take the message of 9-11 and present it. But if we do, how will we do it? We will do it in sackcloth. We will not be the focus of public attention until July 18th. Okay, now, next quote, Greg Controversy. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question. Okay. Good for you. Tell her you that didn't come in. Okay, didn't come in. Uh, her, her internet's too slow. Your internet is too slow. Just get to it quickly. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead, say it. Um, okay, let me just quickly say this. So, in Revelation 11, um, when you were speaking about the two witnesses that are crying and crying. Um, I had a problem with that initially because I thought that the two witnesses had to do with um, the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy uh, during the, the like the time of the Sunday law, like when there are, when there's a persecution and stuff. But then now I'm trying to reconcile that with the, the thought and uh, I'm looking into Ezekiel chapter 9, I think. Um, and I don't know, but I'm trying to see if it, it fits. Does it fit with Ezekiel chapter 9? Um, I think it's verse 4, where it's speaking about the children of God that are crying and crying for the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Could could that be? Because that is speaking about the time of the sealing. Well, it's a sealing time period, and it's also speaking about the children of God um, and the abominations that they see within Jerusalem. And I don't know if that could signify or um, speak to maybe the children of God uh, uh, sort of I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, you're making me sort out your question. And I'll try to sort out your question a little bit if I understand it correctly. Right here, we're on the verge of reading several quotes to show that from 9-11 until the door closes is the ceiling time. All right, it's the ceiling time. And in this period of time, in the terminology of Revelation 11, we're giving a message in sackcloth. In the French Revolution, up here, this history here that we have three witnesses to, we're plugging these three histories into here. Okay, this is, this is where these two witnesses are going to be attacked, they're going to die, they're going to lie in the street for three and a half years. But the reality of it is, Sister White will tell you that the two witnesses that come under attack in the French Revolution, they arrive in history back in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation, the 1500s. They've been prophesying long before they get to this history. So we've been prophesying for a long time. This is where we're being sealed. This would be Revelation 9, verse 4, where they're sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the church. But you're going to get the seal right here. So I, don't, I think we're, if I'm understanding your comment, comments more than questions correctly, I think we're saying pretty much the same thing. Anyone in this group want to clarify what you thought you heard her saying? Isn't sackcloth, though, related to uh, when, it's like, because of like Job and stuff, when everything was horrible for him, isn't that when he put that on? A sackcloth can be a symbol of sighing and crying in, in Ezekiel, but sackcloth, as we look at it in the time period of the French Revolution leading up to it, the Waldensians were sharing the message, but they were doing it secretly. They had sacks of things that they were selling, and in those sacks they had their biblical uh, manuscripts hidden. So when they went to Daniel and sold him a pot, and they saw he was willing right. to hear... And in their Pardon me? And in their clothes. Yeah, and in their clothes. So, so sackcloth is, can mean more than one thing, but for us, I'm saying that here, at this point, we're going to become the focus of attention because we are going to now. This is Elijah's offering. The distinction between the true and false prophet has been made. Now you're going to become the subject of, of the attention of the kings. But back in here, anyone that's watching what's going on now is saying, oh, this is just, it's just some offshoot of Adventism. Adventism has lots of offshoots. This isn't interesting. Take me to the next channel. Let me, let me point you to these things to move on. I don't know if I... Is this Sister Mamela, I don't know if I, if I spoke to what you were asking or not, but I've got to get through this. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. This is one of the foundational points of reference in this movement. What, I'm on page 16 of the notes. 16? Yep. And I'm, I'm jumping forward to just touch briefly on the preparation day, and I'm saying that what leads to the close of probation is clearly illustrated in the scriptures. But what I want you to see here is that as she's making this, she's talking about the, the close of probation and the preparation work. Clearly revealed. There, the preparation work that leads to the close of probation is clearly revealed. And then in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 214 and 216, when the Sunday Law decree, when the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. When the door closes, probation's closed, you have to do your work of preparation before the door closes. And when the door closes, you get the seal. We're in the sealing time. The seal is placed when the door closes. So, 1533. I'm saying that the day of preparation is from 9-11 until the midnight cry. That's the preparation day that leads to the day of the Lord. 
okay, when probation is closed. And in Deuteronomy 15, um, verses, Deuteronomy 10, verse 4, and chapter 18, verse 15 through 22, it talks about the day of assembly. And the day of assembly was the day that they assembled to receive the law. And when was it that they received the law at Sinai, at Horeb? It was in 1533 B.C., <clears throat> okay? And it, this is verse 4 of chapter 10. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly. Okay, then if you go to chapter 18, verses 15 to 22, it says, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall you hearken, according all, to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. I have this entire passage because it's a familiar passage with us. This is... Deuteronomy 18.18 18, we refer to, but what I'm saying is we know that from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd is 1,533 days, but 1,533 B.C. is when they came out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and received the law. And when they were receiving the law, that was the day of the assembly. That's this history here, okay, the day of assembly leading to the close of probation. Now, the day of the Lord's preparation. Review and Herald, I'm on page 17 now. Unfortunately, this is a long quote. Read it on your own time. I'll start it. The third angel's message must go over the land and awaken the people and call their attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Another angel unites his voice with the third angel and the earth is to be lightened with his glory. That's 9-11. Okay. And then there's much to be said, but drop down to the last bold face, still talking about the history of 9-11 and the third angel's message. She says, here we're in the waiting time. At 9-11, what, what begins? The tarrying time. The first disappointment in Millerite history was on the first day of first month. And what did it usher in? The tarrying time. But for us, the first day of the first month is 9-11. And what does it usher in? The tarrying time. She says, she's already referenced the earth being lightened with his glory, that's 9-11. She says, here we are in the waiting time, in the day of God's preparation. The waiting time is the day of God's preparation. That leads to, what's preparation lead to? The day of the Lord. Sabbath. Okay, in Isaiah 27, 8. It says, In measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. This is the day of the east wind, and it's stayed. It's restrained. What is the day of the east wind? The rough wind. It's the four winds of Revelation 7 that are stayed, that are restrained during the sealing time of the 144,000. That's this history here. This is the preparation time. And will our churches humble themselves before the Lord in this day of atonement? Will they put away their sins while, which defile their garments of character and separate them from God? The present is our day of visitation. This is our day of visitation. The sealing time from 9-11 till the door closes. It's the day of preparation. And the last one there from Desire of Ages. The Jews misinterpreted and misapplied the word of God, and they knew not the time of their visitation. The years of the, of the ministry of Christ and his apostles, the precious last years of grace to the chosen people, they spent in plotting the destruction of the Lord's messengers. And that's what we were saying uh, about here. Right here, this is the, the sealing time. This is where the great seal in the United States this is the day of visitation. Begins when the, the divine symbol comes down. The divine symbol. And goes till the door closes. Till the door closes. Sealing time. Preparation time. Day of the east wind. Day of the assembly. So, that has been established in this movement for quite some time. 
and I mentioned it yesterday, so I'm going back to page six. An earthquake. We read this yesterday. The first paragraph under earthquake, France was shaken as if by an earthquake. And turn to the next page of your notes because I want to comment on France being shaken by an earthquake. I want Stephen Haskell to comment on it. The second, the big paragraph there on page seven, this is Stephen Haskell from Story of the Seer of Patmos speaking about the French Revolution now in Revelation 11. It says, the restoration of the Christian religion in France marked the beginning of its modern history. The revolution of 1798, you notice the historians say 1799, but he's, he's placing his emphasis where I place my emphasis too, I agree with him, 1798, okay, but inclusive, exclusive reckoning, it's 1799, but he's saying the revolution, he's marking it as ending in 1798 at the deadly wound. The revolution of 1798 is spoken of as a great earthquake in which a tenth part of the city fell. France fell. The beast received its deadly wound. Not only was the reign of the papal tyranny at an end, but the power of the monarchy was shaken, and the vast army of nobles, which some historians give as 7,000, lost their titles. Okay, that's worth noting, because in Revelation 11, it talks about 7,000. Okay, and historians say 7,000 of the royalists in France died in the revolution to fulfill that. He's pointing to that. The government was in the hands of the middle classes or the common people. The exaltation of the scriptures is always followed by a government which recognizes the equal rights of all men and by a religion which grants the privilege to every man to worship according to the dictates of his own conscience. Men who advocate a system of government that rejects the atoning blood of Christ or an educational system which exalts reason above faith place themselves on the verge, the very verge of a precipice and the next step will produce a repetition of the terrors of France. The blindness with which men repeat the experiences of the past is amazing. The Jesuits may not be responsible today for the trend which many public institutions are taking, but without doubt, the method the Jesuits used are repeated in the 20th century. Amen. I'm going to kick it up one century. Are repeated in the 21st century. Education which leaves out God is putting the government in the hands of statesmen who will eventually exalt the God and goddess of reason. Okay, so I, I want you to see that is, this is standard Adventist understanding to associate the Jesuits with the attack against truth here in our history. Nice people. Yeah, they were did everything open, oh, we were yeah, told. Open in there. Okay, so, um, so there was a, what I'm saying is in this history of the French Revolution, there's an earthquake and there's darkness. And now I'm going to mark, or I'm going to page six, Mark 1533. Turn to Mark 1533. And Stephen, Odilio, others have put this in place, but it needs to settle in deeply. Verse 33 of Mark 15, and of course we are saying, yes, 1533. And when the sixth hour was come, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So 1533, we're identifying that this is the sixth hour, and this is the ninth hour, as we proceed, that the midnight cry, the Sunday law, Verse 34, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What do you have there? You have a double doubling. Okay, so here, he has a loud cry. Over here, we have a midnight cry. Because he illustrates the end from the beginning, 
okay? Sixth and ninth hour. Um, and some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the, the ghost. Okay, so he cries again with a loud voice, gave up the ghost. Sixth, ninth hour. Now to your... Your notes, we read this, I believe, yesterday. We have darkness from the Bible, but you have a quote there from Review and Herald. And what I'm wanting you to see now is the quote from Selected Messages, Book 3, page 387. <coughs> page 6 of the notes. America where the greatest light from heaven has been shining upon the people can become the place of greatest peril and darkness because the people do not continue to practice the truth and walk in the light. When does the United States become the place of peril and darkness? At the Sunday Law. This is a Sunday Law. This is the first Sunday Law. Darkness. This is the second Sunday law of Daniel 11, verse 41. There's going to be darkness here too. Where does America become dark? Right where the French Revolution became dark. Right where darkness came into the story of Christ. Between the sixth and the ninth hour. Okay, This is darkness happening here. Because of the light rejected. And there is an earthquake. The earthquake represents what? In the French Revolution. The removing of a tenth part of the city. Okay, so f France is being removed in this history, but France is typifying who? The USA. Is the USA being removed in this history? as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, from here to here it goes down, is it a tenth part of the city? Yes. It's, it's the premier player of the United Nations even now. But here it's even going to take a more secure uh, control of it. Okay? So that's the earthquake and darkness. And we just read... Um, Haskell's commentary. So now I, I broke this. That's where I ended these notes. That I, and they didn't get sent over that way. I sent them over wrong. We are done with notes number one. And now we're on notes number two. And I already started into notes number two in the last presentation. So we'll, we'll trudge through this a little ways. But we'll, we begin on the top of page one of today's second notes. And it says, Daniel's three touches. And three touches Daniel. Right? Three touches Daniel 10, 19. Okay. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's a couple things going on in this verse. It says, Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man. And he strengthened me and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And I said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. So, this is the third touch in Daniel 10. But this is where we see the doubling of be strong, be strong. Which is, what do we identify that as? The doubling. Midnight, midnight cry. So Daniel has taken three steps touches to get to the midnight cry and we understand that Daniel 10 that, that here Gabriel is going to open up to him the whole story of Daniel's last vision and what begins in Daniel 11 is the story of the 45th president of the United States right I mean it, there's some preliminary to get there but that's where it takes you to so where does he take him in that context Gabriel comes He's touched him twice. He's at the midnight cry. He opens up the 45th president of the United States. 
What does he open up to him? The blessing. He's opening up the blessing of the 1335. Trump, this history, is touching, okay? It's the 1533, the 1335. This is where the blessing comes. So Daniel's being blessed. He's been told to be strong, but how many times do we find strengthened in that verse? Five times. It gets translated twice as strong. Be strong, be strong. Therefore, we see the doubling. But it says outright, He strengthened me, and I was strengthened, and for thou hast strengthened. But the word strengthened is the same word as strong. So if you're just looking at the Hebrew, five times are strengthened. Who's strengthened there? The five wise virgins that Daniel is represented, representing. And when are they strengthened? They're strengthened at the third touch, at the midnight cry. And this takes me back, this takes me back to Gideon. How many times is Gideon touched? I don't know if he's touched. How many divine interactions does Gideon have? He has three. You're just guessing, aren't you? But you got it right. All right, you got it right. And what was the? What happens? The first divine interaction with Gideon. He says, "Don't leave." An angel comes down. An angel comes down. An angel comes down. That Sister White says is Christ. No less a personage than Jesus Christ. He says, "Don't leave." I want to bring you a gift. So Gideon runs and gets him an offering and puts it on a stone. And what's the angel do? He brings fire down out of heaven and consumes the offering. That's the first interaction, divine interaction that Gideon has. What's the second? The fleece. The fleece. And what's the fleece? Well, among other things, it's a doubling. Is it not? Yeah, he doesn't like it the first time. He doesn't, he, he, was, he lacks faith all the way through. Show it to me, Gimmit. Show it to me in reverse. And what's the third? The third is when he goes into the camp. Goes into the enemy's camp. And, and where does he get touched there? With the book of Daniel. What is that? Those three touches are the three steps of the three angels' message. The first one, he fears. You can, you can get into Gideon. He fears that angel. Okay, when he first meets that angel. And before the angel leaves, he gives Gideon a command. What's he to do? This would be 9-11. What's he do? He says, go tear down my, your, your dad's altar to Baal. And at 9-11, what was the altar of Baal that we had to tear down? What did we have to do at 9-11? What did you say? Go back to the old past. No, go back to the old past. I thought he tore it down in the middle of the night. He was worried. Yeah, he was he scared all the way through. Yeah, he tore it down in the middle of the night, no doubt. But he had to go back to the old pass. And in 9-11, we had to go back to the old pass. What did we have to tear down? The old I mean not the new pass. I don't know. The the false doctrine that had come into Adventism. Does Sister White say anything about doctrines being this this as useless as the Idols of Baal? Ah, yes. False doctrine is a, a, an idol of Baal. And at 9-11, the people that returned to the old past, they had to tear down the Adventist theology that had, they had taken from Catholicism and apostate Protestantism and returned to Miller's approach to God's Word. Okay? Yeah, many things. Line upon line. Okay, and then there's a doubling. Is the second message a doubling? And is it in the second message where you see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Is the midnight cry in the Millerite history an illustration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Amen. The doubling of the midnight cry in the story of Gideon, the two fleeces, what's it about? The water. Who gets the water and who doesn't get the water? And what's in that story? Two classes of worshipers, because in the second angel's messages, the two classes are, are manifested. Before the door closes at the third. Where's the door close? January 11th, when he goes down into the enemy's camp and he sees the dream and the interpretation of 
thereof that opens up the blessing of Daniel 11. Okay, so this is big stuff. This is speaking, this is present truth. This verse 19 of chapter 10 of Daniel. Okay, we walked through. The blessing is coming to the history of Donald Trump, if you want to say it that way. Coming to the 45. Blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to the 45. To the 1335. Subtract 1290. 45. When you touch that, Donald Trump comes into history on November 9th, 2016. If we're going to see this blessing, we have to see, the Lord has to remove his hand. And in, in a, the next month, he removes his hand from Rafi and Paneum. And Rafi and Paneum are giving us the dynamics that all of Daniel 11, 40, 45 is structured on. And the dynamics are, first, the king of the south wins. Second, the king of the north wins. And it's the key that opens it all up. Whether you're looking... Comment. Pardon me? Comment. Comment. Go ahead. Um, Gideon's fleece is the second. It's in the center. It has to do with a lamb being slain because a fleece is a lamb. So it's the cross and it's structured chiastically. So that's another confirmation. Good on you. Amen. I see it. I get it. Um, yes. Okay, so... Now, um, <laughs> the blessing was coming to the history of, Dan of, of Donald Trump. Okay, and Daniel 12.12 12 is where this promise is. And of course, 12.12, 12, it's a doubling. And it's the 144,000. And Rafi and Paneum is the key that opens this up. That we were supposed to begin to really study in, Daniel, in, in December of 2017 and onward, um, but we didn't. We got waylaid. We got waylaid, and, and I, I was saying that that was a, 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 it's a year later, not a month later. Okay, so Daniel asked this question af after the last presentation. I'm going to walk through this very quickly with you. The question you'll see as we go through under church and state. I've already went through these, these ramifications of 45. Under church and straight, state, on page one of your notes, go to Zechariah 1. And the, I'm still dealing with the story of the king of the south, but you can't deal with the story of the king of the south in Daniel 11 without it intersecting with the other kingdoms. You got the kingdom of the dragon, the king of the south, the kingdom of the papacy, the beast, the kingdom of the false prophet, but you got the kingdom of the 144,000. And the storylines of the kingdom of the 144,000 is prophet, priest, and king. The king is the throne of David, the story of King David. Uh, the priest is the story of the temple. Okay, and that's where we're coming up with this 15. Seven and a half years, David reigns in Hebron before he reigns 33 years in Jerusalem. Seven and a half years to build the temple. Seven and a half, seven and a half, 15. It equals 1533. But we know from Ezra 7, 9, where the midnight cry message opened up to this message, that Ezra gets to Jerusalem at the midnight cry on the first day of the fifth month, on August 15th, 1844. So the, the, the way marked... Yep. The seven and a half and the seven and a half, they run concurrently or you're just laying them? They run, con they run concurrently. They run concurrently, but I'm adding them. I understand. Them. I'm adding them in spite of the fact that they run concurrently. Okay, thank you. In, on 9-11, we were to lay the foundation of the temple and build the temple of the Lord. Okay, so it took seven and a half years for Solomon to build the temple. So from 9-11, projecting seven and a half years forward, the temple's finished in seven and a half years. But 9-11 is Hebron, because David is anointed four times. He's anointed in 1989. He's anointed at 9-11. He's anointed at Jerusalem, the midnight cry, and he self-anoints himself at the Sunday law. So David was anointed at 9-11. That's when the horn of David begins to bud. But he's going to 
there he's anointed over Hebron and he rules for seven and a half years. But when he gets to his third anointing, which is Jerusalem, he's now anointed over all of Israel. This is where the Levites join the priests. David is king over the priests from 9-11 to the midnight cry for seven and a half years. But then he's king over the united Levites and priests all the way to the Sunday law. Okay? And he reigns there for 33 years. So in Zechariah 1, verse 13 through 17, it says, And the Lord answered the angel that talk with me with good and comforting word, comfortable words, so that the angel that communed with, communed with me said, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. Why is he jealous? And I'm very sore to ple displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am now returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Why is he jealous for Jerusalem? Because the image of jealousy has been set up. He's dealing now with four generations of rebellion. And at 9-11, when we return to the old past, we get confronted with the four generations of rebellion, of Adventism, and we will be tested by those same four tests. And that's where I was going and I lost track. When Gideon tears down his father's altar to Baal, when Gideon throws out the doctrines of the theologians of Adventism after 9-11, how many men does he take to do it? Ten. Because it's a testing time. It's a test whether you will return to the old paths or not. And they begin to build the temple. Now in chapter 2 of Zechariah, verses 10 through 13, it says, Sing and rejoice. When do, when do God's people sing and rejoice? Midnight cry, loud cry. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Who's a daughter in Bible prophecy? It's the last generation. A daughter is a woman, so it's the church. But a daughter is the, is the final generation. Um, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Jerusalem, for lo, I am come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And, and when do people join? They join at the midnight cry. Yes. The Levites join at the midnight cry. They join at the loud cry, the Nethanims. Mm -hmm. In both places you're going to sing because one's the midnight cry and one's the loud cry. Okay? And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee, and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. When does the Lord choose Jerusalem? On the first day of the fifth month at the midnight cry. Jerusalem is chosen Okay, it gets built for seven and a half years and then the Lord chooses and the throne of David is established and it is lifted up above all the mountains at this point. It becomes the ensign that is lifted up. First in the United States and then in the world at the Sunday Law. Isaiah 2. Isaiah, go to Isaiah 2. I know you know this, but it, it's not just a, a nice poetic connection, it's absolutely airlight, airtight truth. Verse 2, Isaiah 2.2, 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days. When? In Isaiah 2.2. 2. Midnight cry time period. Midnight, why are you saying midnight cry time period? Because it's doubling. Because of doubling. Oh, is that what you're going to say? You're going to go with that? Yeah. Okay, I, 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 is that what 2.2 2 represents? What about 2.20? What about 2.20? He has now chosen Jerusalem again, it is restored. 220, 22. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of God of Jacob and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Lord, the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
Okay, he's choosing Jerusalem at the midnight cry and he's lifting it up above all the hills. Why? Because they're the ones that predicted the Lord's judgment that just took place and shocked the entire world. Well, also one of the comments that Sharmila made on here was the was 2020 is also a 220. Just take out that first zero. 2020. The uh, year. This is the... Oh, yeah, yeah. 2020 is, if you drop that first zero, is a 22, 220, yeah. This year is, is when it gets lifted up. No, she's saying four times five, 45. Four times five is 20. 20. And you take 20 equals 2020. And then she said... What? That's what four times five. I get four times five is 20. And she says 20 equals 2020. She's adding, she's doubling it. Okay. And then she's saying that 2020 equals 220. Yeah, I only mentioned That's one that made sense. Okay. They, they all make sense. All right, so uh, it, it, one was a little bit more difficult to follow. Now, in your notes, I have 1 Kings 6, 37, 38. It says, In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month of Ziph. And in the eleventh year, so what's four from eleven? Seven. And in the eleventh year, in the month not of Ziph, but the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, according to the fashion of it. So he was seven years in building it. Jerusalem, the, Jerusalem, the, the temple was built in seven years. A question from the floor from Blake says, wasn't Ju Jerusalem chosen at 9-11 where you're saying they're chosen at the midnight cry? I, I He's building Jerusalem. I don't care if I, I, maybe he's choosing Jerusalem at 9/11, but Jerusalem is chosen as the ensign at the midnight cry, based upon Ezra 7:9. Okay, I'm just I, I'm a, almost every symbol we deal with is progressive. Mm -hmm. So what I want you to see here, the month of Ziff is the second month. You have it underneath. And the month of bowl is the eighth month. What's two from eight? Six. Six months. So when the verse says that it took seven years to build the temple, it started the seven years in the second month and it ended in the eighth month. So it actually took seven and a half years to build the temple. But in the definition of ziv, it says the second month, meaning brightness. Okay, so at the beginning of the building, the earth is lightened with His glory. Brightness. 9-11. A primitive root properly to shake off, that is figurative, to agitate as with fear. 9-11. Fear. It's one of the characteristics of 9-11. And then at the end of the seven and a half years, in the eighth month, the definition of bull, it says in the sense of rain. Is there rain at the midnight cry? Yes. That's the, when it's poured out, without measure in terms of its relationship to the sprinkling that begins at 9-11. Produce, what's it mean that produce? There's fruits being gathered in now. A crop, and it means to bring forth. So even the beginning month and the ending month are speaking to the beginning 9-11 and the end, the midnight cry. <coughs> Seven and a half years, okay? And there you have in... 2 Samuel 2.11 and 1 Kings. Yeah, they're produce now. Yeah. And, and you have in 1 Kings 2.11, and the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So when he's the king over the house of Judah for seven years and six months, how many tribes is he king over? Two. Who's, who's with Judah? That was 2 Samuel 2.11. Benjamin 11. and... Um, um, you said 1 Kings. No, I, I, I did the next one too. Okay. The next one, I, I just think it's interesting that where it's saying David ruled in Hebron for seven and a half years, that's 2 Samuel 2.11. 
but when he speaks about ruling over Jerusalem for 30 years, it's 1 Kings 2.11. They're both at 2.11, whatever that means. And the, David, the days that David reigned over Israel, what's Israel? It's all 12 tribes. Okay, sometimes if you're comparing it with the southern and northern tribes, it's 10 and 2. But here, all the tribes are united when he reigns from Jerusalem. And the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and 33 years reigned he in Jerusalem. Because when you get to the fifth day of the first month, you're at the midnight cry, you're at July 18, 2020, and now who's going to join the priests? The Levites. It's all united. And what have we taught for some years now, from Midnight Cry to Sunday Law, what's happening in terms of Ezekiel 37? The two sticks are coming together. Okay, so you have the formula there. Although the, I, I'm not denying that the seven and a half years that David reigned from 9-11 to the Midnight Cry when he reigned in Hebron over Judah and Benjamin runs concurrently from 9-11 when the foundation and temple is being built until the midnight cry when it's finished. They're running concurrently. But I'm taking both of those two numbers and I'm adding them and they add up to 15. So from 9-11 to the midnight cry is 15. And then David rules in Jerusalem for 33 years. And then the temple is lifted up as an ensign. That's why I have David in the temple at both those points on that illustration. Okay. Luke 1.24 and Revelation 9.10 are both speaking about five months, which we place here. This is when Zechariah becomes dumb and Elizabeth is in hiding for five months. And this is the 150 years that takes us to the midnight cry in Revelation 9. Okay, so 150 is what? 150. Two witnesses. Take this out. 15 is in here. 33 is in here. Yes? So we've now reached the United States and Donald Trump, as the 45th President of the United States, we will take that up tomorrow. Um, and I'll get these notes organized so those of you that want the actual sequence that we went through today and that we'll go through tomorrow, you can download them tomorrow. But you'll see that we're going to go through the beginning of the United States, the first seven presidents, followed by this, the next ten presidents that leads to George Washington that typifies Donald Trump. And we're even going to... Okay, that's turned off. We're even going to go in to the presidents of the General Conference because you can see their pictures in these notes. So, what's Blake's question? Hang on. Hang on a sec. Tell him to hang on a sec. Hang on a second. We are in a Tarian time for Blake's question. Alright. Go ahead, ask it. Oh, yeah, no, I, this I, isn't, I this isn't Blake. This is Thomas. That's Thomas Blake. Yes. Um, I hope I didn't throw you off when I asked about 9-11. Um, but, obviously I've always understood 9-11 to be the time where the, the priests were chosen. But then, Judging by what we've just gone through, does it make sense that this, at, um, at the midnight, quite uh, July 2020, would that not be the Gideon experience where the majority of the people are cut down, so the 300, because you still... You haven't been keeping up with things. Okay. That, bad on you. Now, I can say that to him because I've known this brother since he was really young and now he's got a family. <laughs> Let me show you. You brought up Gideon. Yes? Gideon goes through how many purgings? Two. Okay. Yeah. okay. What's the first purging? It's right here at 9 11. From 32,000. 
Down to 10,000. Okay. Right here, 22,000. Turn back. What's 22? Restoration. Restoration. Okay. The Lord now is restoring. He, he's taking the beginning of Adventism, a movement, and he's restoring a movement. Because he's going to finish this work the same way he began it. He began it with the movement. It ends with the movement. In between, the movement becomes a church. But the church being passed by right here. 22,000 are left in the dust. 10,000 go into this history. 10 being a symbol of what? A test. They're going to be tested. Right? What are they going to go to? They're going to go down to 300. Yes? What's, what's 300 from 10,000? It's 9,700. They went down to, nine, to 300 on September 7th, which is 97. On September 7th, 2019, the movement, the testing of the movement was over and it went from 10,000 down to 300. This is also, this is also evidenced by the math. The math tells you that November 9th is 63 days after September 7th. And 9 times 7 is 63. It's also attested to by the story of Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13. 1 Kings 13 took place in the year 977, and September 7th was on the Sabbath. So it's 977. That's amazing. It, it's amazing, but the 300 is put in place from September 7th. And from September 7th, until November 9th is 63 days, and 63 days after that takes you to January 11th, 2020, when Gideon goes down into yeah. the camp, and he, here's the dream and the interpretation thereof. This is the chiastic structure of midnight. Okay, this is, you, you haven't been keeping up, you need to catch up. Get online. Hello? Hello. Um, can I just add something? I don't know. Go for it. Um, when we look at the line of, I'm looking at that line that says nine levels, then I cry, and they look, and I'm open to correction, but um, I just, I was trying to plug in 508, 538, 1998. Um, well, obviously, the 538 and, um, and oh, well, it lines up with the midnight cry. So, 538 <laughs> being the time period where the dark ages actually began, and um, 1798 being the time period where it ended. I don't know. I'm open to correction, but In, I was just thinking. Have you been listening all day long? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, th this morning I mentioned that I didn't have my page one. And on my page one, I have 508 right here at the midnight cry, and 538 right here, and that makes 1798 the close of probation. Okay? And okay. It, it, this is. This is, a, we've had this in the public record for quite some time. This is airtight. This is the first Sunday law in 508, the Sunday law of Constantine. This is the, the Sunday law of the, the Synod of Orleans in 538. This is the Sunday law in the United States. This is the Sunday law in the world. This is the universal Sunday law where probation closes. So yeah, you're right on target there from what I understand. So 538 is, is Christmas. Um, also, the, you said something about 7,000. Uh, 
and um, I was just thinking like the seven the seven thousand could go with the the leap the seven yes the lever. Yeah, it, in uh, Revelation 11, verse 13, it says, And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and in their earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And Haskell points out that in the French Revolution, which is this time period, there were actually 7,000 of the monarchy of France, of the royalty, that were slain. But you're right, this is the history from here to here of the Levites, and the number of the Levites is 70. So it plugs right in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for starting to participate. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we are amazed at the, the way these lines tie together with one another and support each other. We ask that you'd help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to see the connections that we have the ability to teach them to others. And we ask that you also use the Holy Spirit to convict us of the, the bottom line of these things that we are now entering into the crisis that all the Bible prophets spoke about coming and the time period which all the Bible prophets wanted to live in. Help us get our houses in order, our hearts and our minds in order, uh, that we can be tools in your hands during this time. We ask a blessing upon the work we're doing here and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.